Hey, dude, I was just saying to everyone, today's conversation is hydration yep. and electrolytes, and this probably links to a common theme that keeps coming up on the group page, which is the keto flu. Right. So first of all, Dustin, talk to us about hydration and the link to electrolytes. Yeah, so uh, hydration is complex. I always tell people it's not just the, the amount of water you drink, it's what's in your water. And this is something that a lot of people are confused by. Um, but hydration, so keep this in mind, especially if you're trying to metabolize fat, hydration is even more important. And when you're in ketogenic state, you're, it's, it has a natural detox or diuretic effect. So you're going to urinate more. And so you have to offset that with better hydration. And that's often why people may feel to the keto flu, which may be a potentially linked to medication and drugs and other things too. So they can get really, you can get really deep in the keto flu, but hydration is the simplest, easiest thing that you can start to do. Um, and it's not just about water. It's also, I, I encourage high level electrolytes. Um, some people may have to increase their sodium intake um, to help offset some of those components, but it's huge. And when you look at fat metabolism, um, you, you, you treat fat through once your body's metabolizes it through breath, through urine and through sweat. And so all of those have a huge impact on if we're not hydrated well, that that's going to slow down the process. Now, I have a question that a lot of people ask me all the time, right? So like all of a sudden you're in this state where, I don't know, carbohydrates hold on to more fluid in the body. We've decreased the level of carbohydrates and we suddenly start feeling dehydrated. We start getting the, the keto flu or severe dehydration. And then you start drinking loads and loads and loads. And then I get people worried about, well, now I'm actually going to the toilet even right. more. Does that not have the same effect that if I have an excess of water, am I expelling electrolytes faster in that manner as yeah. well? So yeah, you, you are. That's why, you know, we like to use the kind of term half your body weight in, in, in ounces is kind of like a general rule of thumb. The reality is we don't actually know how much water anybody should eat. It, it's been it's a it's kind of a fallacy. It's been made up. Sixty four ounces was made up like it wasn't because what I, what I mean by if you have somebody that's 500 pounds and they're drinking 250 water a day that might be excessive for their body right at the same time you have somebody at 100 pounds 50 ounces might not be enough for them based off of their body right i know those are two extremes but a good rule of thumb is to use that as like kind of the benchmark um i think it's more important that people that tend to feel really thirsty all the time most of the time they're drinking water from a bottle source or they're drinking water from a filtration system that's a reverse osmosis or they're it's distilled um, most bottled water companies, especially your lower quality brands, like the, basically the less expensive water, is usually filtered through reverse osmosis. And then they put minerals back for taste, but that's not minerals back for your health. It's just so the water tastes somewhat like water. And that to me is where we get in trouble. That's why those people will tend to drink a lot of water. And they don't really realize it without the minerals in the water, you're actually going to create a diuretic effect. Like a bodybuilder to, to lose water, they drink distilled water because it actually pulls out of their body electrolytes and minerals, which creates a diuretic effect so they can look more lean. Not necessarily what you want to do for health and wellness, but, you know, so th I hope that makes sense. So it's, uh, um, and then keep in mind, if you're on more low carb and you're eating carbs, you are going to, if you eat water intake and you eat carbs, you're going to store more fluid temporarily, and then it's going to dump the next day, which can help your urine to seem to fluctuate a lot. And that's something you have to kind of learn. Yeah, and I think what's really important to, to for people to understand is why are the electrolytes so important? Like, what 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 do they do within our body that you know helps eliminate things like the keto flu? What is the purpose of actually having electrolytes in our water to function better? Yeah, so electrolytes are are really important. Um, so inside your body, there's multiple electrolytes. You have chloride. You have uh, so magnesium you have potassium there's, there's it's not just one thing um you probably if you've been looking into keto or low carb you probably heard you need salt um and salt sodium is an electrolyte basically you look at intercellular hydration so when you look at a cell you have hydration on the outside and the inside you want it to have a really nice little flow and what happens is based off of the you know the american diet the mexican diet the canadian diet uh what can in the New Zealand diet? Uh, what can happen is is you overload one versus the other, and and so you start looking at sodium, which is a very common one that you'll hear a lot of. What one that's missed a lot is potassium, 
And so you're looking at, it's more of a ratio between the two. So a well-formulated electrolyte is important because what it does is it helps balance that out, right? Now you can try to eat more electrolytes, eat more food that has these things in it, but you find is that majority of human history, we got it through water. Food wasn't always plentiful. So water should be the primary source. It's just challenges today. We live in a world where water's filtered, it travels, we're not drinking out of rivers anymore, or it has a chemical in it that we're trying to filter out. So we have to put more energy into our water for improving that. And electrolytes are a great tool for us. Now, also keep in mind, if you live in the desert, San Diego, Arizona, parts of Mexico, um, Nevada, like that's a big deal because you're now in a desert. You're, in, you're more physically active. You're physically active and you're drinking water that isn't sources in any places. So now you're more prone to dehydration, uh, even if you eat really clean healthy. So um, I, I have a couple recipes and a couple ideas for people that want to be better. One of the things I've always uh, sort of dealt with with uh, some of the, the, the clients that I've had on board is that when they're, when they're doing keto in general, right, and they're decreasing the carbs, potentially they're in that early stage of prioritizing protein, they're not having a lot of fat, they don't realize how low their electrolytes are. Mm. And, you know, you, we talked about it, I think, yesterday or the day before, that the RDA for things like sodium is actually really, really low. And people right. don't understand what that looks like. Like right. the RDA for sodium is actually, it, it doesn't sound very high, but when you measure it out, it's actually quite a bit of salt. So if I could throw a tip out there for people, I have suffered when I've gone carnivore quite hardcore for a month in palpitations at nighttime. Literally, the first time I ever did this, guys, I thought I was having a heart attack in the middle of the night. I was freaking out. And I remembered, oh, my gosh, I, I haven't been taking any electrolytes. I just got up in the middle of the night, pink Himalayan sea salt into a very small glass of water, chugged it, and within two minutes, my heart had just absolutely relaxed. My cells within my body were communicating better to each other, and it just put my body into a really natural state. Right. Another tip I'd love to give people is, you know, like using magnesium as well. Magnesium can be a great tool as well. But I think with the group being recipe-wise at the moment, hopefully we're going to help educate people more. Can you name some fruits that are really great for sort of like electrolytes, adding potassium, sodiums, all that sort my of stuff? My number one is actually avocado. Um, is my number one. Uh, that is great for electrolytes, good fats, it has good fiber in it. And it's like a kind of a, in the sense of keto, it's a superfood. Um, and the other one is bell peppers. Now, if you're a nightshade person, you have to those. Uh, if you don't know what that means, just ignore what I just said. But uh, you, you, if you are a person that avoids nightshades, then you would. Have, but green bell peppers, people think bananas for potassium and, 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 and to help with cramping, but often, um, bell peppers have more and potassium um and then also you have um uh, uh avocado which is great magnesium's a little trickier because magnesium is also used up when you're under high levels of stress so most people can't get a magnesium without supplementing it also so i recommend magnesium glycinate if you're constipated magnesium citrate. um if you want it more brain and relaxing mal uh, magnesium malate or just some other suggestions i have um i know you and i both have different supplements use ours already has part of that and then we also get potassium what we um which is a great tool to have right um i will say this um um i have a test for people that are going keto uh, and the reason why i want to bring this up is that sometimes people are going through the journey and they're like i feel crappy i don't feel good and they want to quit and they're like and then they say that didn't work well what we know is if you can elevate ketone levels sustainably continuously it'll Forever, metabolically, health-wise, but it takes time, and it and typically takes people between six months and a year to truly master a low-carb style and make your and help yourself to fill and feel energized and feel great. All but the same things with the vegan diet, you're gonna feel good at first, and then and then you fall off, and then you have mix-ups, and then six months later you're like, I don't feel that great anymore. And what happens is that it takes a long time to formulate that diet, whatever diet you choose to. So be patient on the process. But a little experiment I give people with. We really want to test if you're if you're not feeling good. Maybe you're fatigued or you're lightheaded. Just your your energy is off. Take one sixteen, one sixteenth of a teaspoon of sea salt, preferably Himalayan, Himalayan or Celtic, in a shot glass of water. Like you said, drink it down. Have some water after that. 
and then 30 minutes do it again and see if you feel better. And if you feel better, that tells you that overall you need to start increasing not just sodium, but electrolytes in general, sodium those. Um, because if one's low, more than one's low. I hope that makes sense. If you find one low, most likely others are low too. Um, so that's like a nice little experiment you can do, and it kind of gives you the indicator that you should invest side of things. And over time, as you adapt to the ketogenic or a low carb diet, then it's not as, you get a lot more freedom and flexibility when it comes to hydration. Uh, but initially your body's going through a lot of changes. So I, I helps. Uh, and then if you, you want to look up, if people are afraid of salt, um, Dr. Brett Scher, uh, he's a good friend of mine, one of the leading cardiologists in the world. He, uh, he has some really good articles on um, how salt is misunderstood. It's like there's a big fat lie, but there's also a big sodium lie out there. And he's like, you know, if you're not eating McDonald's and processed food every single day, he goes, it's really hard to overconsume sodium in a regular, a regular diet. Said, it's actually hard. Now, if you're just all eating this processed food from boxes and, and fast food restaurants, well, then, yes, you can do that. But for the majority of people we're talking to are taking a conscious effort of getting healthier, more prone to go too low than too high. I love what you said there, eh? Like you're talking about like sustainable lifestyles again. I remember, well, I don't remember. I know the statistic is something like most people will lose a considerable amount of weight, fat, whatever you want to call it, in their life about two times. And generally the process is... 70% of those people will actually put the weight back on within the first year. 80% will put it back on in the second year. And 90% of people actually put the weight back on within the third year. So I think what we're trying to do by educating everybody here in this group is it's like, it's not a quick fix. It can be a quick fix, but how in the long run does that overall affect your health and wellness and, you know, your quality of life? So super important. And it probably leads into... We're about to start our 10-day challenge. Not this Monday, though, guys. We want to get it really dialed in. We're going to start it next, the Monday after, which I wish I had a date because that would be useful for everyone. If you're interested in learning more or knowing more about our 10-day challenge, let us know. Completely free, awesome challenges. Um, we have our book link. And I got creative, and I think if I'm pointing to it, that's where it is for me. There's a link right here that you can click on and go directly to the book link. Um, Dustin, give us your quick two minutes, because I know you've got a call with Rob at 4.30, so give us your quick, in case you've forgotten. Uh, 2.30, your time. Um, give us your, your quick, quick down low on the challenge that's coming up. Yeah, I mean, this is what I tell people. Your journey is a journey. And it's, it's the tortoise and the hare. It's actually more story, the longer story to the tortoise don't know. And too many people try to sprint to the end. But the reality is, is your journey is a marathon sprint, sprint through it. And the biggest message that we're going to share with you all is it's actually psychological. It's not what to eat. It's not all those other things. It's what gets you in your own way to sabotage yourself back to your old lifestyle. And it's because you get uncomfortable changing. And so this, this, these challenges are, are there to push you change. At the same time, they're going to push you further than you keep going. So you might do this challenge. You're like, I can't keep that, but I have one or two little parts of it. And then what happens is that's the marathon part. And so what, what we found is anybody that's consistent all day long, every day, and does their thing, they don't get to there where they want to be. The person that tries to change it all really fast never gets to where they want to be. It's the person that's in the long journey that does little sprints periodically throughout the journey takes the time to learn from the lessons are the ones that stay. They're the 10 percenters. The 10 percent, we don't want to be the 80 or the 90. We want to do percenters. The challenge is going to do for you to help teach you how do you change your life long term rather than just fix that's not going to work for you. The most important thing is you want to become the example for the people you care about the most, and that's why we teach it this way. Yeah.